Good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on where you are at the moment. Uh, we are having a truly global event about a, a topic that is both regional uh, and, and uh, national in some sense, but international and with some global significance as well. Of course, I'm talking about our discussion on Mongolia and China. Um, I'm Professor Chris Alden. I'm one of the directors of LSE Ideas, and we are here to uh, to uh, share this event with you with a great panel of speakers. Um, this this topic is one that has uh, sort of emerged in the aftermath of of the COVID um, policy, and uh, it's one that uh, these these speakers are eminently qualified to to speak to the question of of uh, the resurgence of trade between uh, Mongolia and China, the the, the economic opportunities. Uh, the, the pressures that might the, that are a consequence of, a, of an expanding uh, Chinese uh, interests, et, et cetera. Um, this is a, an LSE, just one word on LSE ideas, and then I'll, turn, I'll introduce the speakers. LSE ideas is, is the foreign policy think tank of, of the LSE. It's, uh, it's uh, been around for, for uh, 15 years and uh, one that has... Um, had, has sought to engage with the academic communities, not just in the LSE itself, but to project and engage with our, our counterparts outside. So this is a, a, a this is a project that has uh, deep roots in academic scholarship, but also policy making and policy communities. This particular event is one of our projects, China Foresight sponsored. So China Foresight, do check the website, and you'll see that it's very active and very very. Um, uh, of focused on on matters Chinese, but in both the domestic and the international side. So, without further ado, if I could uh, introduce our speakers, um, we have uh, uh, Dr. Bill Bacalis, who's an economist and has worked on socioeconomic development and in China Mongolia, has served as an economic advisor to the to the Prime Minister. Um, in there, as well as a leading uh, economist for the UN, for the United Nations resident um, coordinator, and worked for UNDP and and, and other um, uh, uh, regional banks in in the area. Um, so he he will he will be uh, stepping in. I will introduce the other two speakers as well, and then I will turn it to, over to Bill. So, um, uh, Professor. Uh, Nam Jiladori uh, Enkabayar, apologies for difficulties with that. Um, Professor Enkabaya has a master's degree in business administration and is a director of fiscal policy in the macroeconomic uh, and macroeconomic policy department of the Ministry of Finance, has served as an advisor to the Prime Minister of, of Mongolia and also worked in, in the World Bank setting on, on the similar topic, holds a, holds a post in, in the Department of, of Policy uh, in uh, the Academy of Governance University in um, Mongolia. And after him, our third speaker will be uh, Dr. Um, uh, Mr. Sukhbatar Chandmani. Mr. Chandmani has a, a BA um, and from Mingchuan University in Taiwan, an MA from politics in, in um, in Peking at Peking University, served in the National Security Council's executive office, and currently um, works at um, on the institute at the Institute for Strategic Studies, and has uh, written on, published on Sino-Mongolian economic relations. I'm going to stop there and get down to the business of of our talk. And and please, if I can turn it over to you, Bill. Hey. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chris. And I'd like to also thank both of our speakers who've joined us from Ulaanbaatar today for this workshop. Um, and I would also like to welcome all participants who are joining us online and on Facebook to, to this panel discussion on trends and prospects for Mongolia-China relations. Uh, Mongolia has a large area and a small population, only 3.5 million people. But I think most of us know that historically, as they say, Mongolia has always punched above its weight 
It's uh, a, a country of great interest and geostrategic importance. It's landlocked between two giant neighbors, China and Russia. Mongolia is rich in mineral resources. It's a thriving democracy located between those two giant neighbors who are neither of which is a democracy. And it's done a remarkable job, I would say, as a longtime observer in maintaining warm relations with an impressive array of countries that's even more impressive in today's global climate. Uh, close relations with those two neighbors, with the US, with the UK and Western Europe, with Japan, with both North and South Korea, India, Turkey, countries of the former Soviet Union, Central and Eastern Europe, and many others. Uh, for Mongolia uh, to balance close and friendly ties with such a, such a group of countries is really quite an impressive achievement. Today, we're focusing on Mongolia's relations with one particular country, Mongolia's powerful southern neighbor, China. Uh, before Mongolia's <clears throat> democratic revolution in 1990, trade with China had been quite minimal. And a lot of things have changed in the world since 1990. And one of them has been China's remarkable economic growth over these 30 years. And along with that growth has been a very rapid expansion of economic ties between Mongolia and China from, a, from that low starting point to a much higher level as today's speakers will make clear. So I uh, look forward very much to hearing presentations. And after that, we will move to q and I'd like now then to hand the floor over to uh, Professor Enkbeyer, who will give the first presentation. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you for the chance to opportunity to present today about China Mongolia trade relations. Uh, my presentation is mainly focusing on trade between Mongolia and China. Okay. okay. Slides is. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, everyone know about the impact of the COVID, and of course, the Mongolia is the one of the country located very close to just neighboring to China, and that means in the during the COVID period in 2020 and 21, uh, and the COVID restrictions impacted on Mongolian economy. You can see on the graphs and uh, how. GDP growth is decreased, and uh, uh, Mongolian economy is also very uh, dependent on the mining, and that's why usually we have uh, two different uh, GDP growth by the MF term, including uh, mining GDP growth and non-mining. And uh, uh, during the COVID period, we have faced uh, some economic problems and challenge. Uh, you can see from the MF uh, statistical numbers. In uh, 2020, we had uh, growth is decreased, and 2021 is just 1.6% uh, growth. And uh, mainly, all economic uh, indicators dependent uh, uh, highly on the exports, uh, mainly to the China. Uh, it will be uh, clarified later on. And uh, during uh, 2021, a Mongolian coal export also decreased, and uh, 2021 as coal export uh, just uh, 16 million ton, twice uh, lower than the previous year. So, uh, in order to explain Mongolian uh, uh, economy, you need to understand the, which the main sector of the economy in Mongolia. Up to 2003, its the main sector was the agriculture and service. And starting from 2003, it's the first time we exported cooking coal to China. It means we don't have much experience to exporting commodities to international markets. 
we have just 20 years now exporting coal to Chinese market. So uh, one of the example here, United Nations Trade and uh, Development Agency report, uh, commodity dependency report, the latest one, 2021. If you look the countries, how much dependent from the commodity sector, is the Mongolia one of the highest, maybe one of the first highest level. 94% uh, of the export comes from the mining sector and 7% from agriculture sector. So totally 97.9% dependent from the commodity sector. So uh, it's graphs from the Australian uh, Department of Industry. Uh, Mongolia is the, one of the uh, uh, metallurgical coke and coal exporting country. In some years, we was the fourth after Australia, US, Canada. But nowadays, is the Russian exports becoming higher to the Chinese markets and Mongolia becoming fifth uh, largest coke and coal exporter. So here is the uh, Mongolian trade with the China and the Russia uh, export. So after the mining boom, after 2003, is the mainly our export comes from the mining sector. So it means Chinese export is the nowadays is the highest one, but it's the Russia, trade with the Russia is decreasing. So mainly about, so we have uh, last year, our export was 12 billion US dollars. Is this about 84% of course you mentioned before, is the comes from the commodities and around 40% uh, it passes from the copper export and 32, 33% comes from the coke and coal export. And third, biggest export is the iron ore to the Chinese market and et cetera, others commodities. So mainly our export concentrated on the, heavily concentrated on the mining. So that's why government at end of 2012 approved new uh, policy, new revival policy to in order to support the economy. This policy consists from next, next six sub chapters. First one, cross-border trade revival policy. Second one, energy sector policy, third industrial policy, and urban and rural revival policy, green development, and finally, productivity increase, how to productivity increase. So uh, I'm, in this uh, presentation, I just uh, will focus on first chapter, but how we uh, planning to increase our cross-border trade with the, our neighbors, two neighbor. So our, our goal to enhance our cross-border entry capacity up to three times and connect Mongolia railway to Chinese railway. Maybe uh, some people will uh, let be surprising, but uh, up to now we have just one connection with the Chinese market and other ports we transporting coal by the uh, uh, transport, after transport. So we want to also expand, expand uh, our transportation and uh, want to develop uh, main uh, ports with the Russia, Alton Bullock, and South Port in Zamiud, Sanshan, and other ports. So you can see here on the map around the world, around the Mongolia, we have a lot of uh, ports, but mainly it's the important ports here is the Zamiud. Uh, port with the Chinese market. It's connected by a railway. And Russian Sohwat is the very close to the town club coal mine and Shivihore. For all the uh, Mongolian export consists around 15 million ton commodities, but mainly it's we exporting from the truth that these three ports, Samiut, Russian Sohwat, Shivihore. But up to now, we don't have connected yet uh, this Russian Sohwat and uh, other ports. We just built uh, last two years, uh, railways from Sanshan to Tavantolgo and Tavantolgo to Tsaganghat. And this year, so last year, we have also built this new railway to Hang port. But these two ports is still not connected yet. Uh, it's, uh, it looks like a similar picture. Uh, and we also want to develop and uh, our policy to railway development policy also aiming to build to eastern part, to uh, so Chinese northeast side. 
and about railway uh, expansion. We uh, last two years built new railway from the Taun Tolga coal mine to Chinese border Kashi uh, Sohat. It's around uh, 250 kilometers railway we built, but it's not yet done because final destination. It's at this moment we built up to this point Tsagan Hat, and in order to complete this railway, uh, this time we're missing uh, 12. Uh, 20 kilometers to border point, Kashan Sokhat. And also this a uh, little bit challenging because we have different of uh, railway gauge. Mongolian uh, railway is the uh, Russian standards, 15, uh, 20 yeah. millimeters wide gauge, but this Chinese is the standard gauge, 14, 20. So means in the connection on the border is a little bit difficult. Also on the uh, this border point located on the hillside. It means uh, maybe this connection uh, requires a little bit higher costs. And not only railway, also we uh, expanding uh, our transit, transit corridor to Russia, to China. It's the AH3 main highway. Uh, at this moment, last two years, we will we'll be also expanding uh, roads from the Ulaanbaatar to Darhan. Uh, this project not yet uh, finished. We also uh, this year and the next year will be expand this uh, road projects. So on the south side and border point, uh, Zamiut is the, one of the biggest points traditionally. We have uh, connected by a railway to China. Of course, there's different gauge. That's why usually we transport uh, uh, reloading uh, cargoes and uh, transport cars. So last two years, we are also expanding these uh, ports, expanding uh, after, after transport and the railways. So about trade with the China and Mongolia, uh, about, you know, but Mongolian economy size is just 15.3 billion US dollars. Uh, GDP per capita is the 4.9 thousand dollars. But compared to Mongolia, it's the, of course, the China is the second biggest economy in the world. So we cannot compare it to totally Mongolia and China. So our final destination, our commodities is in Mongolia. In the Mongolian economy, uh, if you look at the statistical numbers last year, 2022, uh, in the Mongolia GDP is the $333 billion, means more than 20 times bigger than Mongolian, Mongolian economy. So by the GDP per capita, you can see it's the 13.9 thousand means it's reached already reached high level income countries. So all the final buyers of Mongolian commodity coal and iron ore is there located in Bogot, Bukhot in this area. So means it's by the destination, it's not so far around uh, 500 kilometers from the town of means it's the, compared to other exporters, we are located very close to the Chinese market. So one of the example is the, you know, is the Chinese Baotou city is the biggest metallurgical city. It's the, just this city GDP is the 15.4 billion US dollars. So means it's three times bigger than full Mongolian economy. So means Baotou GDP, if the Baotou GDP in the Mongolia GDP increases, it's the, we still have good markets. As you know, just a few days ago, China had two sessions. Uh, during this two session, Chinese prime ministers uh, they, they, they set the goals 2023, Chinese uh, economic growth, uh, the targets 5%. It means good for Mongolia. Also, they have huge transportation and infrastructure project next five years, means they have demand for all coal and iron ore. So means Mongolia is the, even though we, uh, selling all products to the China, but we think Mongolia is the part of the global supply chain by commodities. So, end of what's the result after two years? So, this year results, end of the last year, uh, our export um, increased, uh, total export reached to 12.5 billion, compared to previous year, uh, end of 2021, was it's 9 billion, means it's a uh, uh, high increase. And budget foreign trade balance is the 3.8 billion. It's the good results. 
And by the volume, coal export increased two times, reached uh, 32 billion uh, ton coal export. So you can see here the numbers last five years. It's the main commodity exports to Mongolia is the copper concentration, coke and coal, iron ore. So uh, last year results is the, uh, uh, it's good, it increased. Uh, copper concentrates 13%. Uh, coke and coal uh, increased twice. Sorry, this, this percent is still wrong. And the gold, gold also increased. Just iron ore, iron ore is, is the volume a little bit decreased, thirty percent. Means uh, last year export is just previous years. So, but uh, uh, still we have some challenges on the foreign trade and border uh, because we had not yet connected the uh, two main ports to the China. Means the uh, border capacity is not enough compared to 15 million tons commodities. We have still have delay and higher cost railway connection with the, on the Chinese border. And this year, last year, parliament approved new law on the commodity stock exchange. This new law will uh, become effective from the July 1st this year. So it means uh, it will affect both sides of Mongolia and China. So. We don't know yet what will be in fact after the implementation of this new law. But uh, this time, today's uh, level, we have some preliminary trading on the Mongolian stock exchange. So not only Mongolia, as you know, is the biggest exporter to Chinese market is the Australia, Indonesia, and also Russia. And the rest, recent days, you know about the, after the uh, Western countries' uh, economic sanctions due to economic sanction, Russians exporting more commodities to the Chinese markets, not only uh, coal, also uh, uh, crude oil and other commodities. So uh, we have higher competition for the next year. And uh, also we have some other geopolitical risks in this region. And we have a lot of issue under the state-owned mining companies, governance issues. And of course, they, depending on the commodity price and volume, we have a uh, very volatile fiscal policy and we have uh, we still have huge debt. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, Bill? Well, I think you wanted to hand over to Mr. Chen. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for the audience, we will go immediately to the next presentation from Mr. Chandmani, and then we'll open to questions and answers for, for both speakers. Thank you, Professor Ankbeyer, for that uh, very uh, informative presentation about trends in Mongolian exports to China. So, uh, Mr. Chanbani, I'll hand over to you now. Okay, so, hello everyone. Uh, so today I will talk about a uh, brief background on the current bilateral relations and uh, general perspective of uh, both sides prior to the pandemic and the war in Ukraine and how these circumstances has affected the past uh, reluctance of Mongolia to increase uh, trade with China and the steps we are taking to balance these uh, in the, uh, dependence uh, issue. So uh, Mongolia is a country that shares the largest land border with China and the Current uh, bilateral relations, as Xi Jinping put it, is at the highest it's ever been with stable high level uh, exchanges. Uh, with the visit of President Xi Jinping in uh, 2014, both uh, countries established uh, a comprehensive uh, strategic partnership. Uh, and China has uh, been Mongolia's uh, largest uh, source of uh, investment and trading partner for the last 18 uh, consecutive years. Therefore, uh, Mongolia's relationship with China has more economic uh, nuances than uh, political. 
uh, both nations are enjoying a uh, peaceful uh, setting with no disputes or unresolved issues. And with China's relaxation of the strict pandemic policy and with the implementation of the new recovery policy, the trade between the two countries in the near future looks uh, optimistic. So in this sense, China and Mongolia appears to have all the uh, favorable conditions for a fruitful economic uh, relation. So what is uh, China's economic perspective of Mongolia? So uh, Mongolia attracts two types of economic interests uh, from major Chinese businesses. Uh, one is uh, mineral resources. And overall, these mining products meet uh, the three requirements of the uh, Chinese buyers, which are uh, proximity, uh, low price, and uninterruptible uh, transport. And interestingly, uh, major uh, mining deposits have been discovered close to the Chinese border, but because China is the only potential uh, market for the minerals, gives them the upper hand and they have, then they are able to uh, exert uh, control over the price. Compared to China's uh, other borders, the Mongolian border is uh, conveniently connected through flat terrain. So this uh, encouraged Ch Chinese uh, corporations to invest in development of uh, large mining deposits and related infrastructure. Over the past two decades, uh, China has developed its domestic railroad system, which could easily be extended to Mongolia's uh, mining deposits. And the other economic interest uh, relates to Mongolia's potential uh, as a transit route to Russia and to Europe. This is one of the reasons why the Chinese uh, government designated Mongolia as one of its uh, BRI economic corridors. Uh, according to the uh, uh, monitoring study conducted in uh, 2020, the implementation of the economic corridor was uh, around 56%, uh, which were mostly on paper. So since the launch of the project, there have been uh, no direct impact on the uh, Mongolian economy yet. Uh, although both countries have made commitments at the highest political level to improve economic uh, relations, little progress has been made on the ground. Uh, in comparison with uh, Russia's Far Eastern Railway, the Trans-Mongolian uh, Railway is much shorter and it is older and slower because it was uh, the railway was built in the 50s and requires a gauge change at the border. Uh, given the long-term benefits for the Chinese, uh, they are interested in investing and um, constructing new railway infrastructure which would also enable uh, Chinese stake in the operating and the uh, in infrastructure. But the main hurdle uh, is came from the Russians, uh, along with uh, Mongolia's political and business factions. The Russians were able to influence the country's domestic politics to maintain its railway standards as part of its uh, geopolitical strategy. Uh, sorry. Uh, and beyond this interest, uh, Chinese business haven't shown much interest in uh, Mongolia because of its, uh, because uh, for these uh, large Chinese corporation, Mongolia is a small market uh, with lack of infrastructure and the population of uh, triple million is roughly the size of a small city in uh, China. So China from the Mongolian economic perspective, uh, Mongolian political leaders are faced with the need to the balance between uh, two choices, which are to benefit from the world's largest uh, economy, while at the same time uh, trying to uh, reduce its dependence on it. To manage this uh, dilemma, Mongolia finds itself in a vulnerable situation because of its uh, landlocked location and isolation from the uh, global economy. Mongolia has uh, no other option but to diversify its uh, economic partners. The reluctance to increase trade with China had two factors. So one was uh, domestic, because Mongolian politicians support policies that restrict investment to reduce uh, economic dependency. For example, in 2010, the national security concept was revised to include the clause uh, restricting the total investment of uh, one country 
uh, foreign investment to the maximum of one third of the total foreign investment in Mongolia. Uh, while the other factor is uh, Russia, Russia's uh, geopolitical or geoeconomic interests in Mongolia. Uh, because economically, China is the most attractive direction given its size, its uh, growing centrality in the global economy. And also Chinese road, rails and uh, ports are the closest and the most cost-efficient choice for Mongolians to transport goods from and uh, through China. In contrast, the uh, Russian uh, rails and ports are slow and impose uh, higher custom tariffs than the Chinese. And based on this uh, rationale, Mongolian businesses support stronger ties with China and pressure the government to open up more opportunities for Mongolian businesses. Uh, besides these interests, uh, Mongolians are also cautious of China in uh, several regards. The most popular concern relates to uh, increased dependency on China and how it could uh, gradually decay the sovereignty and maybe pull Mongolia into its, uh, China's orbit. This fear is uh, based on two logical understandings uh, because similar to any small state, uh, Mongolia feels vulnerable due to its uh, ge geographic location uh, being located next to these uh, major powers. The other is more economic. Uh, if Mongolia permits large scale Chinese investments or state owned companies, Chinese businesses will become uh, uh, powerful economic uh, players and uh, that could easily exert their influence. Also, uh, any closer economic collaboration could trigger concerns among Mongolian businesses that are trying to compete for the domestic and international markets and uh, cautious of being marginal marginalized by Chinese uh, businesses and investments. Uh, in the past, oh, In the past, uh, despite high level agreements and developmental plans with China, little progress has been made to increase the economic uh, relations. This uh, could be explained by examining the uh, different perspectives as well as uh, domestic politics and certain geopolitical and economic interests. Because of these uh, factors, Mongolia faced the dilemma of whether to link its economy and infrastructure with China or to seek ways to uh, slow down and restrict the future economic uh, interactions. But uh, with the introduction of the new uh, recovery policy in late 2021, this was an uh, indicator that the government of Mongolia was uh, willing to increase trade with China and overcoming these uh, past reluctance. With global economy reviving uh, from the COVID pandemic and increasing exports to China does seem like uh, Mongolia's best option to grow at this moment. So in other words, the new recovery policy is policy will uh, pave the way for Mongolia's uh, recovery from the pandemic. And two factors have also influenced in this uh, decision-making. One is uh, the COVID pandemic and the other is the Ukrainian war. These have made it even clearer that uh, China was the best option for economic growth uh, at this current situation. The pandemic had a huge impact on Mongolia's economy, which is uh, heavily dependent on export of mining products and import of everyday consumer goods uh, from its uh, some neighbor. It led to Mongolia's uh, largest economic contraction since the 90s and has led to high risks of unemployment, poverty, and increased uh, income inequality. Over the past two years, the sudden shock caused uh, by the pandemic has revealed the weakness of Mongolia's economic structure. China's uh, strict COVID policy and its slow economic uh, activity have significantly hit Mongolia's key exports to China because of its uh, land border closures and disruptions and poor demand. And the second factor was the war in Ukraine. Mongolia's economy was, uh, economic growth was 1.4% in 2021. Uh, many experts had predicted 5.2% uh, for growth for 2012, but due to the war, all predictions were adjusted. And since the start of the war, Mongolia is suffering from inflation pressures and depreciation of the uh, Mongolian currency. 
It is also uh, immediately affected Mongolia's trade with Ukraine, Eastern and Western uh, Europe, uh, Turkey, as well as many uh, international flights. They started uh, to be, uh, avoiding the uh, Russian airspace, which led to Mongolia losing its uh, overflight fees. So I think these external factors made the need to reopen the border with China more urgent. With the uh, new recovery policy, um, trade, will, trade growth with China will increase, uh, but this will bring up the question on how to balance the situation. Uh, in the long term, Mongolia's main goal is to transition from over-reliance on uh, fossil fuel to a more uh, sustainable option and transforming from a supply of raw materials into an industrialized state. But this will require a significant infrastructure connectivity. And to that end, the successful uh, implementation of the new recovery policy is uh, crucial. In the longer run, uh, Mongolia is seeing a strong growth in non resource sectors such as agriculture and even uh, the technology sector. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, to increase Trade with Russia, Mongolia may have to leverage its, uh, its uh, intermediary position between its two neighbors. Uh, Russia is more interested in economic relations with China, so therefore Mongolia could use this opportunity and expand its uh, relationship with Russia and come would come uh, by uh, via trilateralism. Uh, Mongolia's natural resources are the country's uh, gateway to economic prosperity. But However, for these raw materials and commodities to uh, fully accelerate Mongolia's development and balance China, Mongolia will need other countries to trade with. And this is where uh, Mongolia's third neighbors uh, will come into play. While it's uh, vital for Mongolia to maintain good economic relations with neighbors, uh, Mongolia is ready to embrace third neighbors for business and deepening trade partnerships, attracting investment from these uh, countries is one of the main initiatives Mongolia is taking in trying to balance the uh, balance China. Uh, below, I will uh, mention some of the latest investments and uh, cooperations uh, Mongolia is implementing with our third neighbors. For example, the EU is uh, Mongolia's uh, third largest trading partner, and the new recovery policy presents opportunities for for the development of EU Mongolian trade and investment ties and building on Mongolia's participation in the uh, GSP plus scheme and the EU Mongolia partnership and cooperation agreement. Uh, given Mongolia's uh, GSP plus beneficiary status, which provides uh, Mongolia with uh, duty free exports on 66% of listed goods to the EU and also presents opportunities for Mongolian business to uh, expand their presence in the EU market and for EU businesses to also expand their operations in Mongolia. The EU has uh, heavily invested in Mongolia, uh, funding over 150 million euros into development cooperation and projects between 2015 to 2020. With the successful implementation of the policy, it will offer even greater opportunity for investment and collaboration between EU and Mongolia, in particular in the mining and energy sectors. Next is uh, Canada, which is one of the biggest investors in Mongolia. According to the information uh, from the Bank of Mongolia, the amount of investment from Canada has reached uh, 8.1 billion US dollars, and it's mostly concentrated uh, in the mining sector. Uh, the, the most uh, well-known Canadian investment in Mongolia is, of course, the uh, Oyu Tatra and Gold Copper Mine in South Kobe. And also, India is a good example. Uh, in November last year, Mongolia and India closed a $1.2 billion US dollar soft loan to finance Mongolia's uh, greenfield oil refinery plant in South Kobe. This will be a big push to diversify uh, Mongolia's uh, energy sector. And also Mongolia's perspective, given the instability of the region and its uh, energy dependence on foreign supplies, it, it is uh, Mongolia's interest to have access to uh, alternative and additional source of uh, supply of energy. 
Uh, with this establishment of a fully operating uh, oil industry, Mongolia's GDP can increase by 10% and it will help stop cash flow out of Mongolia and ease the dependence on uh, fuel import uh, from uh, Russia. With the progress of the rail lines uh, under the new recovery policy, they could be more opportunities to work with India and maybe fulfill its interest in coking coal, which is uh, closely tied to its uh, economic growth and high demand for steel. Uh, last year, during a virtual summit between President Hulsuf and Moon Jae-in, bilateral relations was uh, updated to a strategic partnership and both sides agreed to deepen uh, mutually beneficial and complementary economic relations. So uh, based on South Korea's advanced technology and Mongolia's uh, rich natural resources, both agreed to advance a cooperation in mineral extraction, which can be utilized to uh, support South Korea's uh, high-tech industry. And recently, uh, Mongolian Prime Minister also paid an official visit to South Korea, in which he expressed the interest in using the seaport in Busan. Mongolia sees uh, South Korea's high-tech industry and busy ports as an ideal customer and as well as a uh, gateway to uh, reach the world for copper and rare earth minerals. Therefore, in the future, South Korea could play a key role in the logistics for Mongolia's uh, foreign trade. And lastly, we have to mention uh, Japan, uh, which has been the uh, uh, main source of aid for Mongolian uh, aid since, uh, ninth, since the 90s. And the, with the latest Japanese soft loan of uh, 500 million US dollars, Mongolia has uh, constructed a new airport in Ulaanbaatar, which is being currently being uh, in operations at the, mo the moment. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Chandmani. That was fascinating, very detailed and a very interesting presentation, which uh, made clear the motivation behind this quite striking change in Mongolian policy, if, if I may say. I mean, these uh, rail connections from Mongolian mines to uh, to the Chinese border, to the markets in China, have been under discussion for a long time. Uh, the, and yet very little happened for a long time. You've also mentioned that this development of the corridor, this China-Mongolia-Russia economic corridor, that rail line that goes from Zaminod in the south of Mongolia at the Chinese border to Alton Bolak and north at the Russian border has also been under discussion for a long time, but relatively slow progress. But now there's been a surge in Mongolian investment and uh, activity to develop those links to the Chinese border and to, to markets. And that, uh, and you've made clear your view that this is a response to the economic difficulties that Mongolia faced in the post-COVID era and as a result of the war in Ukraine. But that does raise a question, uh, which I'd like to start, I'd like to mention to the audience that Q&A is open now and you're encouraged to post questions using the Q&A function here on, on Zoom. I'd like to start with a question which may be on others' minds as well. And that is, I know from many public opinion surveys in Mongolia that in general, the public attitude towards China and Russia, these two giant neighbors, has always been and continues to be much more tilted in Russia's favor. People have, in general, more trust in Russia as, as a partner and 
much less in China. Uh, this has long historical roots, which go far back. But my question is, how how is this now new thrust to expand connections to China to be more open to uh, to Chinese uh, e economic uh, influence as a result? How is that? being viewed by the average Mongolian people? Is there, is there a concern? Is there a population? Is there a popular, uh, is there concern or reluctance or what is the, what is the general attitude about this, uh, about this acceleration in, in uh, trade with, with China? I, maybe uh, Chanmani, I, Point, give this question to you first, but Enquire, your your thoughts also would be very welcome. Uh, thank you, Bill. I think, in my opinion, there could be a shift in uh, recent. Uh, I think uh, there is a recent shift in uh, public opinions uh, regarding these uh, trading with Russia with China because the attitude and the view of the public has, in some ways, a certain effect on decision-making. And if the initiative was proposed uh, maybe before the COVID pandemic, the general public may have had a little bit of a cautious or, or maybe a little bit wary of this uh, initiative. But since the pandemic hit uh, Mongolia and the border with our southern neighbor was closed and restricted, I think it had a huge effect on, uh, no, it had a huge effect on uh, everyday uh, consumer goods. For example, stores were practically empty uh, with no imports from China. There was no uh, vegetables or fruits. And I think all this had an impact on the uh, general public. And I think it made them uh, realize the importance of the southern neighbor and the uh, normal activity of border and how, and I think it showed how vulnerable uh, Mongolia is when it comes to trade with China. So in this, uh, in this sense, I think in the near term, I think the likelihood of uh, any resistance from the Mongolian public or the political sphere is uh, very low in my opinion. Okay, thank you for your question. Yes, of course, the uh, all people in the generation in the 70s, 90s, 1970s, mostly educated in the Russian and the first uh, Soviet Union uh, countries, they educated in the Russian. Uh, as a second effect, it was uh, related to the technology and the information. Up to 2000 in Mongolia, mostly we have no choice to get uh, Western media information not available. Just after 2010, we had uh, available internet connection to the home public, and they don't have uh, English, mostly mostly speaking in Russian. So now this is changing. Younger generations have different uh, learning, different language, uh, not only English. Many young generation nowadays learning Japanese, Korean, Chinese, nowadays more popular. And, uh, people are more freely traveling other countries and they, they can see what's the difference the difference of the development so i think is the uh, attitude let be changing so mainly nowadays uh, usually in the countryside they're worrying about we're not uh, exporting uh, industrial products we're exporting more commodities we need to uh, more manufactured products and that's why in the countryside they have some uh, uh, local people initiative not to support coal mines and, and so it means uh, uh, it will change on time and time yeah thank you that that, that is fascinating and I may add that on recent trips to Mongolia I've also noticed quite a striking increase in the number of people, such as one of our panelists today, Zanmani, who have studied in China, 
uh, as opposed to having this old former Soviet and Russian background. <clears throat> and this point that you make, Enkbayer, is really very significant. And I mean, China, these connections to China are not only connections to the Chinese market, it's how Mongolia connects to Japan. It's how Mongolia connects to South Korea. It's how Mongolia connects to, to all of East Asia. I mean, the connections through Russia are ones that go, are the older ones that of course go to some of the advanced economies of Europe, at least may again one day when the current uh, sanctions are, are eased. But at the same time, though those are the those those are the old connections to to Belarus to to and so on. So it's fascinating to watch this shift taking place. Quite extraordinary. Along those lines, we have a, a question from one of our audience members, um, uh, Sue Byrne, who's pointing out that there was for a while there was the idea that. Uh, the coal, uh, these resources in South Gobi, even though they were closer uh, in terms of distance, closer to China, that there were ideas about maybe building rail lines to connect them to Russia and, and let them be exported through the Russian port of Vladivostok instead of ship, instead of building the connections to China. And uh, that is, in fact, one of the reasons why there was such a long delay in 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 developing these new links to the Chinese market. Um, so the, Sue Byrne asks the question: What has come of that suggestion uh, of connecting Mongolian mining mines to to Russia and and to the port of Vladivostok? Is that still under consideration? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, compared to other countries, um, uh, railway projects it's Mongolia, in Mongolia a little bit complicated. It's not all, not only technical issue. Of course, it's technical issue and economic issue, and third one, it's more political issue. <laughs> yeah, and some people argue that uh, we have need to 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 gateway to seaports, not only Tianjin. Also, Vladivostok is the second option. Maybe it's it was true that time, maybe 10 years ago. But it's nowadays a lot of things changed. If you look at the Russian policy on the uh, mining sector policy, on transportation policy, and the Russia have big coal mine on uh, Yakutsk, Elginsky, it's the closer to Vladivostok ports. And nowadays they're exporting more than coal from the town Talwa, more than 20 million ton coal to Vladivostok and Vanina. Pacific port. It means Russian railway in the northeast side, they, they don't have capacity more than this coal. So it means Russia is nowadays expanding railway into the Pacific side. They also want to build new railway directly from the LST, Elginsky to the uh, Pacific port, to the closer to Sakhalin. Means they don't have any chance to re-export Mongolian coal through the Russian railway. So only problem nowadays, we have to connect to the R Russian, uh, no, Chinese port. But there is a little bit challenge. Of course, the first is the difference of the gauge. A lot of people saying that <laughs> we have to use the Russian gauge. So, okay, uh, we have already built the Russian gauge. But nowadays is the difference of the height. On the Kashan Sokhat, this border is located on the hill hillside. So in order to complete this project, we need to be need more costly to build bridges. And second one, they need another uh, 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 re retransporting from the rail to Chinese uh, Chinese. So it means this project, not only railway, is the need to be built full projects from the town Talwa to Chinese Kansumat um, port. There is need to be more uh, logistics issue. 
So means, uh, and one of the weaknesses of Mongolia is it's about project, project management. We still don't have learning about how to manage projects. That's why it's, um, we are still building, but not yet finished this railway. Second one is about project financing. We don't have uh, uh, some good experience, except uh, reaching the oil to mine. So in order to we build other projects, first of all, we need to learn good experience, project management and project financing. Thank you. Fascinating. We have uh, another question has just come in. Uh, the question, I'll read the question is that China is shifting now to a more green economy and uh, has made commitments to limit its greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, State-owned enterprises are shifting to more sustainable energies. So is there, uh, if I, I'll reword slightly, I mean, what is the future of Mongolia's coal exports to China, given, given the global trend to shift away from fossil fuels and shift to, to new sources of energy? Is, is this a economic and a strategic concern? Mm -hmm. Enkbar, yeah. your thoughts would be great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all countries who is dependent on the coal export worrying about this uh, uh, green development issues and uh, air pollution issues. And uh, one of the Mongolia, we are also feeling uh, how have bad the impact of the use of coal. And Ulaanbaatar, we have one of the highest air pollution. So of course we were worrying, uh, but it's the, one of the differences that uh, Chinese, we know, but just, uh, uh, this month, China released the green development white paper, green development white paper. So uh, they, of course, want to reduce use of the coal, but it's not sharp, of course, not sharp change. It will be, takes time. And second one, it's about energy coal, not cooking coal. First of all, they want to reduce energy coal, use of the energy. They're building a lot of the hydropower stations, renewable energy stations, I cannot uh, just count numbers, how many there are uh, renewable projects in the China. They're building huge projects, yeah? So it means it takes time. And Mongolian coal is the cooking coal, first one. It's the, compared to full Chinese market, it's not so big. So of course, we uh, in the longer term, we have to shift from the coal. So it means uh, our project, uh, longer term goal, 2050, they have uh, about projects, how do we, um, diversify our economy means uh, and maybe in next 10 years we will more concentrate on the mining products so during this time we have to implement other industrial projects so it's the our government goal mm -hmm. thank you yes that is uh, i i would second what you're saying I think one of the great challenges Mongolia faces right now, if if in the coming years under this new re, new revival or new recovery policy, however you want to translate into English, exports to China do increase rapidly, commodity exports especially, and then GDP growth accelerates and incomes accelerate, how to use that window of, that opportunity that the, that this growth will provide to to build a foundation for more sustainable growth is is really going to be a challenge. Instead of using it as just a chance to you know raise salaries and and just increase current spending, to so long term planning and long term goals. That's really uh, exactly. Yeah. I wish you wish you good luck. As you know, we, we both discussed issues like this over the years. Um, there's another interesting question that's come in, and uh, I'd like to point out, I think the, the question is about every, why does every change of government in Mongolia result in a rewriting of the mining laws? Um, I think one, the main law that was 
change, the main uh, change in a uh, law that was highlighted uh, was this inquiry you mentioned this uh, the change now to make the price of coal and commodity exports more transparent so there be a, a commodity market in which prices will be determined by market forces uh, and this is this was a new law which has been passed and in, in response to we all know the corruption mm -hmm. scandals which emerged at, just at the end of last year regarding some of the coal exports to china so that i don't think that legal change is uh problematic from any uh, from from most points of view i mean uh, you pointed out it could lead to higher prices and make mongolia exports less competitive in the chinese market but of course that's markets have a way to of sorting problems like that out uh, but there is still a, a question and it comes from uh, Pamela Slutz, who has been observing the Chinese economy, uh, excuse me, the Mongolian economy for a long time, as we uh, as we know, uh, is is there stability? So we're, this new recovery policy is is very impressive, but it's not that long before there'll be the next parliamentary elections and. Mm -hmm. A new government may come in after that. That's quite quite possible. And is there the sustainability that's needed for long term growth, for foreign investment, and and for uh, for sustainable growth? I mean, is, are these policies going to be sustained beyond the next election? Yes, exactly. And nowadays, uh, a lot of people talking about sustainability. Yes not only uh, uh, free economists, also some politicians, parliament members are also talking about we need more stable on the legislations. And I remember in the 2019s, uh, World Bank IFC issued uh, one of the reports for Mongolia. It's about investment roadmap, roadmap of Mongolia. This report is also saying that uh, Mongolia need to be good policy for the foreign investment. In order to manage the, with the relationship with the foreign uh, investors, uh, before they change any law and law legislations, we need to discuss with the investors, first of all, to uh, listen the the intention about these changes. But not yet we learn about this uh, so this new money law, also, yeah, we need to learn experience. Also on the foreign trade, it's foreign trade not only managed by the Mongolian law, it's uh, the two sides' interest, uh, sellers and buyers. So in order to implement this new commodity law, uh, uh, we need to contact with the Chinese buyers, how they feeling about these changes. So nowadays, Minister of Mining also having this kind of discussion with the Chinese part. Uh, of course, there, there is um, uh, a lot of things changing. It's not good for the uh, ordinary business. They want to more stable business. So we know about uh, this this time during this uh, geopolitical issues. The Russians, uh, we don't know what condition they're selling commodities to the China. They may be dumping price uh, about. Uh, 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 Gas, the, the Russia already selling a lot of billion cubic meter gas to China. It's not high price, not to selling to European price. They're selling by the dumping price. We don't know, but how Russian companies selling, what price selling to coal to China? It means that there is a lot of challenging moment nowadays. But this, during this challenging time, we, we want to keep our market share to the, in the Mongolia, in China. So we need to be more careful, not just being forced to implement this law. Uh, we need to learn, yes. Interesting. Another uh, issue which is 
I would think on many minds as we listen to your talk today is uh, this relations between your two giant neighbors. This is an important week with the schedule, the visit by Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader to Moscow. Uh, and I noted an, an interesting issue that came up and I'd be, in, we welcome both of your thoughts about it. And that is a very specific question of the railway gauge. So um, the, I'll, I'll add a little bit, the, the central rail corridor, the, the Trans-Mongolian Railway that connects to the Trans-Siberian Railway and goes in into China, that, um, that is owned by a joint venture between Russia and Mongolia, 50-50 joint venture. So basically nothing can happen or change unless both sides agree. Um, and one result of that ownership structure has been, it's been quite difficult to make any big changes, to, to have big new investment. Uh, to, uh, there are many, many ways in which that railway line, as was mentioned, uh, is, is inefficient, old and slow. And then there is this problem of the gauge, which makes trade with China uh, very difficult. What are the chances of resolving the, the problems with UBTZ, the railway line? What are the chances of China and Russia joining together in some way and, and, and agreeing on, on policies that will help develop facilitate trade, transit trade across Mongolia and sort of fit Mongolia smoothly into this, into this growing partnership between China and Russia, rather than seeing Mongolia as a place where their interests compete, which has been the case historically for so long. So, so, so to, to make the question more simple, do Russia and China, if Xi Jinping and Mr. Putin in, in Moscow talk about Mongolia this week, what do you think they're going to be saying? What are the chances that they're going to be saying, let's stop competing to, to see who can have the greater influence in the country and let's start fitting Mongolia more smoothly into, into this growing partnership between us? <laughs> Interesting question. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know exactly what will they discuss in Moscow today, but first, uh, uh, people from the Moscow Russian side they said that one of the issue will be about um, gas pipeline, Sila Sibira Dva. Mm. Uh, if they discuss this issue, uh, some people saying that it will be beneficial for Mongolia because uh, we have air pollution problem. Maybe we can let be change uh, Ulaanbaatar heating problem using the gas. And, but uh, recent days we know about the uh, Russian president uh, Vladimir Putin visited in close border to Buryatia, Ulaanude. During his visit in Ulaanude, uh, Russian um, gas company, uh, Gazprom company uh, head Miller said that Connection with the Buryatia with the gas pipeline, it takes longer time. Maybe after 2032, Ulan would be possible to connect by the gas pipeline. Means the, this pipeline is the, related to the Mongolian Sierra Siberia. So, means even though they have discussing about this project, Sierra Siberia, of course, there is a lot of issue about um, geopolitical issue. But in terms of the, the business planning by the Gazprom, Gazprom uh, they're saying that it will take longer time and high costly. And about railway gauge, it's of course, it's a challenging. And uh, we 70 years using the Russian standard gauge, but nowadays uh, we think that full Asia is transforming to high-speed railways, maglev train, lot of things changing. 
And even though the South Asian countries all nowadays using high-speed railways, and they're using the standard gauge, Vietnam, Laos, and other countries. But <laughs> in Mongolia, because it's different, we have still using Russian uh, gauge. Uh, and it's challenging to, we have uh, changed this uh, Mongolian uh, Russian joint company. So means uh, nowadays uh, we're holding that uh, the, from the line minister, minister of transport and the railway company saying that on the border, they are also using double gauge. In Zamingwood, they built uh, Russian, we already have a standard Russian, Russian gauge, white gauge. And this year, last year they also built uh, uh, Chinese standard gauge means on the importing goods from the China, it makes a little bit easy. And also a Mongolian company, MTZ, Mongolian railway company, he also said that in the next time we uh, build uh, railways, first of all, we need to focus on the border connection. It's correct. The main challenge is the but connection issue. So means uh, at this time, we are using a double track, double, uh, double gauge. So it's the, uh, maybe a medium term, but longer term we have to find more technical good solution because all loading export is the 15 million ton. And maybe future it's become 60 million, 17 million tons. It cannot be reloaded. We have to find the more uh, smart solution on this. Mm -hmm. It sounds as though it's as much a political problem as it is a technical problem, but yeah, we're we're getting close to the end of our our allotted time. Uh, I think we there are no other pending questions from the audience, so uh, I I would thank you both on from my side for these extremely interesting presentations and extremely interesting discussion in the q and a period as well uh, we will we will all now watch to see what statements come out of moscow yes. uh, during xi jinping's visit you will be watching more closely than anybody yes. uh, and we thank you and wish you well and in in the in extremely important work that you're both doing and um, so, Chris, I will hand hand back to you. Thank, thanks very much, <clears throat> Bill. Thank, thank you for for uh, managing the, the the panel there, and thank you to the two panelists who uh, the, the all three of you and to uh, the, our two panelists um, uh, who who gave the PowerPoint presentations. It was great. It gave. I think we know a lot more about the situation than we did before. And it's in, it, it inspired certainly in me a, a sense of the debate and dilemmas of, of Mongolia and, and the cusp of change perhaps that that, that the Mongolia is is on. So we'll keep an eye on that, and I hope we can return to you at some stage in the future. Th thank you again, everyone, uh, for joining us. Um, uh, this was a China foresight project uh, event uh, uh, within LSE Ideas. Do follow our future events. We do all sorts of things around a variety of topics and, and perspectives and always welcome your participation. Thank you very much. Have a, have a good uh, rest you. of the day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.